Right, David, it's lovely to talk to you. It's an absolute pleasure, actually. A real treat. Yeah, they like to be back with you, Luke. Yeah. Um, so how's the, how's the lockdown been for you? This is something I've been asking my guests, obviously, in recent months. How's, how's the lockdown treated you? Well, actually, not that very much differently from pre-lockdown and I hope post-lockdown. You know, I spend most of my life writing books and uh, it's a lonely profession. You, you sit in front of your computer like I'm doing now and you write away and hope for the best. Um, and then, so I've been just carrying on doing that sort of thing. Mm. The big difference, of course, is no travel. Um, and I do an awful lot of talks in schools to literary festivals, especially when a book comes out, uh, but generally, and that's all gone, or at least not gone so much as replaced by online occasionally. So I've been quite busy with new online stuff and learned an awful lot about Zoom conversations, for instance, <laughs> that I didn't know before. But otherwise, we've had a fairly placid lockdown here in Wales, the, the virus hasn't been as as horrible as it has in some other places. Mm. So, and we've been lucky and our son is home living with us and he's been doing all the shopping, you know, that, the domestic <laughs> side has been lovely. <laughs> That's good. That's good. But um, so that your, your new book, which is, which was published earlier this month is called Let's Talk, How English Conversation Works. So what have you discovered then? How do conversations work it's a huge question you've written a whole book on it but uh yeah. i'm kind of wondering how where we can start but uh yeah how do they well, work there are two sides to this one is that when drawing people's attention to the things that they do every day and they don't realize what the rules are underneath those things so you you take a, an absolutely everyday thing like a greeting saying hello or saying good morning or saying goodbye and saying good night. Mm. And you say, you know, I'm going to teach these to students or just tell people about them. What's the difference? And they say, well, there is no difference. You say good morning in the morning. You say good night at night time. That's the end of it. But when you actually analyze the difference, you find that there are some very subtle but very important distinctions. For example, you say good morning to somebody only once. If I meet you in the corridor, Luke, I say, morning, Luke. You say, morning, David. And five minutes later, I see you again. I don't say, morning, Luke, a second time. That would feel very, very odd. Mm. And indeed, if I said it inadvertently, I might apologize and say, oh, sorry, Luke, I've said good morning to you already, haven't I? But at night time, if I'm leaving you and I leave your office and say, good night, Luke, and you say good night, oh, I forget something. I go back in and I pick it up. I say, good night, Luke, good night. Yeah. Good, night. Yeah. good night, good night, good night. Yeah. I can right. say it right. 10 times, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But it's the same with hello and goodbye. Now, most people, because I checked this out when I was lecturing on the subject, I'd say to people, do you know what the difference is in terms of good morning? and good night? Nobody knows. I mean, they know instinctively, but they don't know intellectually. Yeah. So that's one kind of finding that I try to present. The other kind is to... Uh, knock down some of the myths about conversation that are very widespread. What are some examples? Well, interruptions. You know, interruptions get a very bad press. Mm -hmm. If anybody listening to this or watching this types interruptions into Google or somewhere, up come the style guides, which will say things like, you should never interrupt. Interrupt is bad. It's impolite. It's terrible. Avoid it at all costs. Well, of course, there are some circumstances where to interrupt would be, um, would be impolite. If you're having a very serious conversation and it's on a very formal subject matter and you're in full flow, then an interruption is likely to be uh, considered poor, poor form. But in the kind of informal, domestic, everyday interactions mm. that I was analysing, interruptions are all the time. People are yeah. always chipping in. And they're chipping in for positive reasons. They're saying, oh, yeah, uh, because what you just said, I remember I had an example exactly like yeah. that. Go on. Yeah. Uh, and people respond positively to this and say, as it were, say in their minds, thank you very much for that interruption. It's helped me actually shape what I was saying 
and perhaps even prompt me to go off in a new direction, which I hadn't thought of before. So almost all the interruptions that I found in the data, and there were hundreds of them, almost all of them, well, I think there's just one or two where somebody got a bit sniffy, uh, almost all of them were, were positive things. They helped the conversation to flow along and people responded very positively to them. So that's the kind of thing I mean when I say, you know, you're breaking down a myth. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. There are lots and lots of sort of uh, uh, kind of like moments where you've pulled back the curtain on conversations and kind of like show us what is really going on. Do you find that people, I, I think I probably asked you this last time, but it's always something that strikes me whenever I read your work, is that sense that, um, let's say, lay people who are people who aren't linguists do get very passionate about language and they all, that people are very opinionated about it. Um, um, I mean, do you never take an, an opinion on, um, on language? Do, does, does nothing ever kind of trigger you in terms of the way people use language? Does nothing ever irritate you? Because, for example, if I talk to my family, as I was this weekend, the subject of language always comes up and it's usually someone complaining about how, you know, people do this, people say that, and it annoys them. It's all, always but, a complaint, isn't it? It's never a complaint. Yeah, play. that's always true. A complaint. Yeah, yeah, lots of complaints. I mean, oh, I may give you an example later on. But anyway, I'm curious to see if, do you ever get bothered by the way people use language? Yes. Uh, I mean, I'm human as well as being a linguist. Yeah. So I've got my likes and dislikes. The difference between being a linguist and being a, a pedant, as it were, mm. is, that, is that pedants try to make the rest of the world speak like them or share their attitudes. Whereas linguists, whether they like the, the usage that they've observed or dislike it, they're not in the business of going out and saying, well, you should like it as well, or you should dislike it as well. That's the difference between descriptivism and, and, and a prescriptive approach to things. So in that sense, no, I, I've never um, been bothered about another usage, which I, uh, which I don't share, um, or I might even dislike. Uh, but what I want to do as a linguist is explain it, try and work out why there is this difference. Where does it come from? Is it a regional thing? Is it a social thing? What is going on? There's only one occasion, one type of occasion, when as even as a, my, my, my as it were, dislike as a, as a human being um, influences the way in which I would operate as a linguist, and it's this. When people who are professionals in language lose their professionalism and don't use the language in the way that they should be doing, having been trained supposedly to do it right. Now, an example, you're in a railway station or a ferry boat. Uh, and actually, uh, I'll take the ferry boat example because uh, I, I'll tell you why in a minute. Mm -hmm. And you're hearing the safety instructions being read out and they're being read so fast that you can't understand them. They're just, the guy has read it a thousand times. So it's and you think, well, sorry, hold on, hold on, slow down, will you slow down? This is important. Uh, and when somebody is professionally using language in the public domain, and you can't understand it because of some casualness or carelessness or whatever you like about the language, then this is where the human being and the linguist come together. You've got to say to these people, look, you're using language wrongly in terms of the audience for which the language is intended. Yeah. And I choose the ferry example because um, uh, Stenner ferries of many years ago were getting so many complaints about the uh, use of announcements that they actually employed me for a week to go in and <laughs> um, train the announcers and the, the interesting thing was this, Luke, that the complaints largely said, I can't understand the announcement because of the regional accent that the person, the speaker has got. Hmm. And it's true that there were people giving the speech from Liverpool and from Poland and all over the place, but that wasn't the reason at all. It was simply that they were speaking too fast. That was the only reason. When they slowed down and took breaths and paced themselves, the fact that there was a regional accent was neither here nor there. Poor old regional accents, they, they get penalized for all sorts of things that actually have nothing to do with them at all. 
So that's mm. the that's the main category, and you know you can generalize it. It's not just public announcements. Uh, people often react in this way to uh, announcers on the radio who uh, forget themselves for a moment and and say things like, um, "That was Symphony Number no. Three by," uh, mm -hmm. and you think, "Sorry, by who? By who? By who?" Uh, and the, the 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 composer is lost because for whatever reason the the announcer has turned away from the microphone or or they've lowered their voice too much. Yeah. So that's another example of professionalism gone wrong. I see, I see. Um, going back to the subject of conversations again, um, what about this conversation that we're having now? Is this, a, is this a, a normal conversation? No, it isn't. And this is a big thing. Uh, I have a chapter on this in the book. But it was a chapter that was written before BZ, as it were, before Zoom. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the thing is, most people now over the last few months have had many Zoom conversations. And at the end, they feel tired. Yeah. You know, especially if it's gone on a while. Now, why? And it's because it's not a normal conversation. So, first question, what are the features that make a conversation normal and successful? And the primary one, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is that there is a thing called simultaneous feedback. Now, simultaneous feedback is when you're talking to somebody and the other person, your listener, isn't staying quiet. They're saying things like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh no, oh, no mm -hmm. really? Oh, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. and so on. That is critical to the success of a face-to-face -face conversation. I can't, any, it's in this conversation, even then, interrupting is difficult on Zoom. I try, you know, if yeah. I want to chip in with something, it sort of can break things up and it's like, oh, stop the jip, jip, like that. And also the technology sometimes, if I make a noise, and I'm recording the audio for this, obviously, if I make a noise, it can cut out your voice. So if just me going, mm, means that suddenly three words of yours have been lost. That's exactly right. And also there's the phenomenon of lag. Uh, so that depending mm -hmm. on where we are and how the technology is doing, your mm -hmm might appear a couple of seconds later, by which time I've done another 10 or 15 syllables and I'm getting a positive reaction or a negative one to something that I said so, many, so long ago and this can be very off-putting. So on the whole, once people learn about Zoom, and also, by the way, in radio broadcasts where a good interviewer will not be going, uh-huh, mm -hmm, uh-huh, all the time, uh, people learn to shut up. And as soon as they do that, then your poor speaker is suddenly on his or her own. So I'm now speaking to you, and I've no idea while I'm speaking whether you're agreeing with what I'm saying or disagreeing with it, um, whether you've got a, uh, if I were face to face, to face with you, um, I'd see from your face, maybe a gesture, and maybe, and of course, the occasional noise that you're giving me feedback. You're saying, yeah, that's good, David. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Or you're saying, oh, hang on a minute, David. H hang on a second. Now, I will pick up on that and either alter my behavior, alter my conversation, or stop and ask you what the question problem is, or whatever it might be. Now, none of that is there routinely on Zoom. So you are on, or in any of these um, media interactions. So you're on your own. You're yeah. always on, as they say. And as a result, and this is quite tiring. Uh, so that if you're having this kind of conversation and it goes on for longer than, you know, half an hour perhaps, maybe less for some people, more for others. Uh, after a while you're thinking, gosh, how am I doing? Oh dear. I mean, is this conversation ever going to end? <laughs> and it, and it's, it really is very tricky. And the more people there are, the worse it gets. So if you're in gallery view, for instance, on Zoom, yeah. and you're talking to a group, as I did the other day with a group of school children in a school somewhere, and there were 15 faces in front of me, um, now it's worse because I can't look at them all. Um, I can't interact with them all. I have no idea whether they are enjoying what they're hearing. Their faces are basically blank or yeah. distracted. You know, somebody is in their house and they 
disappear suddenly and go off for a cup of tea or something yeah. like this, which doesn't happen in a normal classroom. <laughs> 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 mm. So a group situation is even more difficult to stage manage as a speaker than a one-to-one. -one. So yeah. for all these reasons, uh, an online interaction is somewhat artificial, even though some of us are getting quite competent at handling it. Yeah. There, in Zoom, there are reactions. I, I suppose you've explored all these things, but uh, you do have the option to give a reaction. So if I do this now, I'm going to put it on gallery view, which the recording should show. If I, I can give a thumbs up or an applause uh, emoji. So if I give the thumbs up, you end up with that. But um, yeah. I did that in conversation with my brother, I think, recently on Zoom while recording a podcast. And I gave him a thumbs up and he was like, what's that massive hand? <laughs> so it's not quite as um, smooth as, uh, as normal. Inter uh, no, normal. it's tricky because th there are all kinds of interferences. I mean, you might leave it up for too long. Um, mm. So the point where you were approving, and I then make another point, for which you disapprove or, or want to you know, distinguish it and the thumbs up is still there uh, you've got in other words it's like, like playing the piano almost you've got to be able to handle all these yeah. technological things i imagine there are virtuosi um zoomists out there uh, but most of us don't have that kind of facility so anything artificial like that is could could be a good feature but it's tricky to use them well um many i have many things to ask you david um so conversations in english versus conversations in different cultures mm. have you ever had any difficult moments um, during conversations with people from other cultures yeah all the time uh, and this also warrants a, a chapter in the book but it could be a whole book actually mm. and i hope somebody will write a whole book and by cultural differences i don't just mean regional cultural differences I mean cultural differences because of age, because of gender, because of ethnicity, as well as because of region. Mm. And sometimes, of course, all these things come together in one place or another. So I give a couple of examples in the book, but, but really it's a, it's a whole new book to write. So, for example, um, the use of silence varies enormously, doesn't it, from one part of the world to the other. Some people, some, some cu cultures, revel in silence it's a positive thing uh, in a British culture silence is, is somewhat awkward if there's a mm. silence in a conversation people want to fill it and so they will say as quickly as possible something to get so that the silence doesn't last for too yeah. long in some other parts of the world if there's a silence it means nobody has anything to say so that's fine let's just stay silent until somebody thinks of something to say. Now it takes a lot of getting used to. I, I had real trouble with this when I first went to Japan, for instance. Yeah, me too. Japanese, very good example of a culture that value silence and reflectiveness in a way that, you know, I just don't see very often over here. Um, and the very first time that uh, I encountered this, I did not know what to do, you know? I, I felt, had I, had I said something wrong? Um, why has everybody suddenly gone silent? I'd made a point. Um, and then I sort of uh, intervened with myself and, 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 and people sort of ignored it. And gradually I learned, of course. And as a linguist, I was able to talk about this to other colleagues in Japan. And they told me, you see. And so I learn um, from people who have analyzed the situation in that country. So there's that. And then there's, of course, the, the topic of content. Um, what should you talk about? What should you not talk about in a particular culture? Yeah. Uh, there are conventions everywhere. The weather is usually a fairly safe topic for most places. I don't know whether there's any culture in the world which doesn't talk about the weather. At some point there might be. I don't know. I've never had a trouble with that. Um, but... <laughs> I remember one example um, where uh, we had some um, foreign, stu foreign students come to the house mm. and what do you do when you go to somebody's house? You, you compliment the host, don't you, on whatever it is, yeah. On, yeah. On, on the decor or something like that. Yeah. But you don't ask what they cost. <laughs> no. but in this part of the world uh, and i can't remember now honestly can't remember which it was um it, it is a matter of um 
praise yeah. to ask the person how, something, how much something cost because when you give the response, it shows, um, you know, class and, and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm doing very well, you know, and this is- Status. It's, it's a status thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and so <laughs> there was the curtains that said, you know, so how much did these curtains cost? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, these are very fine curtains. They must be yeah, very, very expensive. very fine curtains indeed, not how much do they cost. Right. So, you know, there are things like that which you get, you get used to or you have to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, there are some books around, uh, which I always try to read before going to a country, which say, you know, discover our country and they will tell you some of the things you should do and some of the things you shouldn't do. They're invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what about men and women? Do men and women do conversations differently? Because apparently men are from Mars and women are fin oh, from Venus, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I, I give that rather short shrift in the book. I have a few paragraphs on it. Um, the basic answer is no. Uh, there might be a few. You know, the tradition has been, and, and when conversations were first being analysed, there was this view that, oh, for instance, you know, men interrupt more than women do and things like that. Um, but as, as time has gone by, we've realized that this is just a huge oversimplification. Mm -hmm. There are so many factors involved, the subject matter, the context, the type of audience, all sorts of things. And to try and reduce these to a simple gender opposition is just absurd. Yeah. So, um, yes, it's, it's good to recognize that there are some trends which can affect some people of a different different gender um, you know certain words that might turn up rather more frequently in one gender rather than the other but soon as you try to make these into anything hard and fast like a Mars Venus situation breaks down very very quickly and that's yeah. sort of the message I convey in the book but it's not my message it's a message that I've derived from all the people who have specialized in gender studies over the last 20 years or so yeah 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 uh, what about talking to animals? Is it possible to have a conversation with an animal? <laughs> Most certainly is. Uh -huh. um, uh, I have a section in the book called, uh, what's it called now? Does it take two to make a conversation? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the other party in the conversation is going to reply to you in the way that a human being would. And there are lots of examples. Animals are one thing. Anybody who owns a dog or, or, or a cat or whatever it might be knows very well that if you have a conversation, that the dog sort of is listening and will react in some ways and you <laughs> interpret those responses and yeah, as if it were human. Um, yeah. The classic example, of course, is talking to your plants. Mm. Uh, any plant owner that I've ever encountered, and we have one in this house, uh, talks regularly to their plants um, and the plant just smiles back and that doesn't seem to make any difference the conversation continues and I did read a piece of scientific research once which showed that because the carbon dioxide coming out of the mouth is going to the plant it's actually helping the plant grow yeah that's <laughs> That's what I understood, that actually talking to your plants is good for the plants because exactly, you, you kind of breathe carbon dioxide onto them. They like it. <laughs> yeah, apparent, apparently. But, you know, there are lots of situations. And, of course, the ultimate case, you talk to yourself. Mm. Um, so I go into the broom cupboard and stand on a broom and it comes up and hits me here and I have a conversation with the broom. It's not a very polite conversation, <laughs> but I tell it off. And I give it a good telling off. Uh, and, and, yeah. and, and then the other thing, I've asked lots of people, do you have a conversation in your head about whatever? So you're going to an interview or something like this. And mm -hmm. so you sort of think through the kinds of questions and answers you might get. Or you're just report, reporting to somebody a conversation you had the other day. I'm going to, I'm going to tell... Um, Jane all about this uh, about the conversation I just had with Fred and in your head is going through you're going through this conversation you actually sort of think it through before actually speaking it out later if you ever yeah. do speak it out at all yeah and everybody thinks oh it's just me well it turns out that it isn't just me I don't know whether everybody does this but everybody I've asked 
has admitted to doing it sometimes. Yeah, I, I talk out loud to myself all the time. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not shy about admitting it because it's one of those things, one of those bits of advice that uh, English teachers like to give to their students, which is, you know, speak out loud in English and there's nothing wrong with it. it you know, you're not, it doesn't mean you're crazy or anything. It's <laughs> totally fine to kind of just, you know, waffle away in English to yourself. But I, yeah, I do it all the time. I actually really enjoy it. And it's fun <laughs> yeah. to talk in different accents and things in different situations. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's yeah, and things you, wouldn't, things you wouldn't dare do, perhaps, uh, in a dialogue uh, situation. Yes, that yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, weirdly, talking on a podcast is pretty odd when it's just me on my own. Because mm. essentially, I'm just in a room on my own. And I have to imagine that there are people out there listening to it, you know, and... Uh, well, th this is like radio broadcasting. I used to do a lot of radio broadcasting. When I first did it, I asked the producer, you know, how, how, do, how do I do this? And I got some wonderful advice from some of these very experienced radio producers. And they said, David, you're in a room talking to your wife, your husband, your friend, your mother, whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's who you're talking to. You shut your eyes and you're just talking to her or him. Yeah. And that's what it is. That's all you need to know. Of course, you're reading a script or whatever, but that's all you're talking to. You're in a sitting room somewhere. That's it. And that's what one has to do, I, I think. Yeah. And interestingly, when you're writing a book, um, at least this is what I try to do, I try to imagine the same thing. Uh, I never send a book to press without having read it aloud uh, to myself um, to make sure it, a, it flows smoothly. Um, and if it doesn't, there's something wrong with the writing. Um, mm. In any case, you know, just like now, you're, you're asking me a question, I'm giving you the response. I could, if I had the book here, open it up and read the response to the question, assuming yeah. it's been in the book. Um, and I would hope that the way in which I would read the response would be not too different, colloquialisms aside, you know, and informality yeah. aside from the way I'm talking to you now. That's very interesting because your writing does definitely come across like that. It's very, very readable. It's not sort of overly complex. It's really, really pleasant to read. Well, well that's thank a good... you. Because that is very much what I've tried to do my, my entire life. And this isn't just a matter of gift, incidentally though that must play a part in it, uh, it's also a matter of linguistics. Because when you study the, langu the language of informal conversation, or the language of anything, mm. you realise that there are certain types of structure which are going to cause complications uh, as a, to a listener or to a reader, which to avoid would be a very good thing. Now, what sort of thing do I mean? Well, the fact that if you're writing, and certainly when you're speaking, if you do an analysis of, of hours and hours and hours, you find that on the whole, subjects are short before the verb. And the length of a sentence is concentrated after the verb. Mm. So most of the time when we're talking to each other, and this is especially the case in conversation, the sentence or the clause begins, so I verb did something or other, or my friend verb did something or other. And yeah. the length is after the verb. Now, if you do it the other way around, if you put the length of a sentence before the verb, it immediately gets difficult to understand, or more difficult to process, as it were, and it's more difficult to read. So, for example, and there are, of course, some very famous politicians who do this kind of thing all the time, much to our irritation. <laughs> so, here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. My friends, the party that I belong to now the party that I've been with for many, many years, the party that I love deeply, and one which I think is a party that you and all you listening to me now will value more. And you're thinking, come on, get on with it. What's this about? Get to the verb, please. I need a verb. Yeah. That kind of long thing is disturbing, and not only in speech, but in, in, in writing too. Now, in terms of language learning, language teaching, go to a textbook teaching people about reading, early readers, and ask the question, if it's an early reader, and the language is to be as easy as possible to process, then you would expect the sentences to have a short subject before the verb. Go look. 
because what you find is that in an awful lot of cases, the subject is quite long. So the big bad wolf with the awful teeth went. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, that's already longer than an average five, six-year-old is going to be able to process. The poor kid is already trying to decode the written language, having difficulty there. And now on top of that, you're giving him a long grammatical subject. It's going to get heavy in there. And you can actually test this out. Uh, so we're in psycholinguistics now. Yeah. Test this out and show that comprehension is not so good when the sentence subjects get long. So don't front load the sentences. Don't, that's a perfect way of expressing it. Don't front load the sentences for, uh, for early learners, or I guess the same thing would apply to uh, early adult learners as, as well. You know, keep the sentences as natural as possible by keeping the subjects short. How, how, on, earth, how, how on earth are you so prolific, uh, David? You've written so many books. You just keep coming out with them. What's the secret? <laughs> um, well, the secret is, is to marry somebody who is a wonderful partner. Um, and I got that. Uh, and who is also a writer. Uh, that helps enormously. Um, no, it's very true. Uh, there's no secret. First of all, you have to have the time. And to have the time, you have to have a job that allows you to have that time. When I was full-time at the university... Uh, back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, I did manage to get a few books out in the summer vacations and things like that, but not really. Uh, the job was just too complicated, as mm. it still is, of course. You know, all the admin, all the bureaucracy, all the teaching you have to do, all those things. If you're a researcher and a writer, uh, then... It's not that they get in the way because they actually fuel what it is you're going to be writing about, but they yeah. don't give you very much time. So I left, remember, I left the full-time university world in 1984 and became independent uh, for that very reason. I discovered yeah. that, well, it wasn't a discovery. I, 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 know, I knew that so ever since a teenager that what I wanted to be was a writer. I started writing when I was in my teens in fiction, as, as it happens. Mm. Um, and I always wanted to be a full-time writer and therefore by implication lecturer and broadcaster and what have you but the writing was the thing it's all I ever wanted to do and the university world was getting in the way of it so I left it I mean you know fingers crossed is it going to work no salary suddenly it was a tricky moment but it worked out well and most of the books that you're hinting at in your question have been written since that time okay so we're t we've been talking about uh, Let's Talk, um, How English Conversation Works, which is the new book. But uh, in our emails, it, you told me that actually there's another book. You've come out with another one as well. Uh, since <laughs> writing this one, during the lockdown, I think you wrote another one. Oh, yes. Can you tell uh, us about that? Lock lockdown does strange things to people, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, what it did for me, you see, was because I was no longer taking... See, last year I did 200 days out of the house, traveling around the country and around the world, uh, wow. doing talks and things. Suddenly, all those talks have disappeared. So how do you fill that time? Well, if you're a writer, you write. Now, I'd actually got a draft of something that I had a go at a while back, which I brought to fruition during lock time. And to see the context for this, before I explain what it is, um, that, that I had an ambition as a teenager, which I developed earlier on. And this was, I would love to write, make a contribution to, not necessarily to publish, but to write in every genre. Yeah. Um, and academically, of course, the genres are, as we all know, you know, articles, reviews, essays, textbooks, course books, things like that. But in literature as well, um, I wanted to write short stories, I wanted to write plays, I wanted to write poems, I wanted to write novels, and so on. And I did the short stories, I did the plays, mm -hmm. I did the poems. Uh, sometimes they've come out in books, sometimes they haven't. That doesn't matter, the point is, I did them. Mm. I've never done a novel. 
And the reason I never did a novel was because I got told off for trying once. <laughs> really? Who, who was that? <laughs> Com commissioned to write one. Yeah. Uh, and I had a go at a draft and sent it in. And the commissioning editor said, David, you don't know how to write a novel. I said, why not? And they said, because you don't describe your characters. I said, what do you want to describe the characters for? I mean, you, you know, it's how they talk to each other is the thing. No, said the fella, I need to know, I need to know how, how your characters look. And I said, can't, can't you just tell? I mean, you see, I got confused. I'd been writing plays where you don't have to say what the characters look like because the actor yeah. does that for you. If you're making a film script, you don't have to say, except perhaps as part of a brief, because the actors will do it. But in a novel, you have to say, and I wasn't very good at this. I had a go at it and it was awful. And that was years ago. And I thought I'm never going to be a novelist. So this time I'm going to have another go. And actually it isn't a novel so much as a novella in that it's quite short, but uh, it's, a, it's essentially a, a spy thriller. Mm -hmm. It's called The Encyclopedia Codes. I call it a pseudo-autobiographical uh, novella because it's based on real-life experiences that I had here in this very room when we were editing the Cambridge Encyclopedia, the general encyclopedia, not the language ones, uh, back in the 1980s. And it's based on that. The thought might be that people use the encyclopedia to spy and what would happen if they did. And so I developed a scenario where that actually happened. And as a result of this, the first line of the novella reads, I was responsible for the breakup of the Soviet Union <laughs> because of the way things developed. And I'm rather proud of that. Uh, but did it happen? Well, you have to buy the book and find out. <laughs> ah, and there was me about to ask you which part of that was true. You were responsible. Uh, that's the thing you're going to have to decide for yourself uh, can, once can you, you see it. Now, can you give us any thing. more? Can you give us any more at all, or do we have to wait for the book? Because there, uh, you know, no, it's, it's out already. I mean, this it's is out. the amazing thing. No publisher is going to be interested in David Crystal writing a novel. Come on, uh, I mean, I, I'm. It's not. I'm not that not in that world, you know. And publishers only want bestsellers. So I knew that if I approached a, a conventional publisher, they just wouldn't be interested. So for the first time, I've explored Kindle Direct Publishing and Amazon Paperback Direct Publishing. And I have to say, it is amazing. I finished this book uh, three weeks ago. We're talking in the last week of July. Uh, Hillary and I, my, my wife, who's also a, a book designer and so on, and things like that, uh, she designed the cover. We uploaded it to Kindle and yep. then to Amazon two weeks ago. Uh, it came out three days later mm. and is on the Amazon site right now. And people have been buying it and... Uh, I, I haven't had a copy yet, but people who have, have, <laughs> have bought this have, have sent me pictures holding it up. Yeah. You know, from submitting the manuscript to having a book copy in your hand within three days, it's really? unbelievable. They printed the it that quickly. The quality is excellent, you know. Wow. Uh, so I, I, I have avoided, um, you know, Amazon publishing because I've never having, had a need to go there. But when you come across, when you're doing something and you know it's not going to interest mainstream publishing, I've made a discovery here and I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm terribly, terribly impressed. So it's out. I can't show it to you because I haven't had a copy through myself yet. I, I've ordered one. <laughs> I'm curious though. I don't know if you, if you're going to be willing to share it with us, but there's, there isn't there an anecdote that the book I've seen on Amazon, you know, you have the look inside option yeah. and I can see the first few pages and yeah. you start by telling an anecdote about a time when you were going to be a guest speaker at an event. And that seems to be when it all kicked off, but I, I'm, you know, I'm intrigued. Obviously that's the point. Uh, but how much of this anecdote can you share with us? How much can you tell us before we actually get the book? Well, you can read that if you go uh, type David Crystal Encyclopedia Codes into Amazon. You can go there and you can look inside the book and you'll see the first few pages indeed. 
um, because I checked it out because I'd never done this before and I wanted to see what happened. Um, And indeed, uh, the... It was when, you see, it was when we were sending the first edition of the big encyclopedia. Huge thing. I'll show you. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. This big thing, you see. Yeah, the Cambridge Encyclopedia. Huge, huge book. The Cambridge Encyclopedia. And we were editing it for the first time. uh, Putting it together for the first time in 1989. Mm. So the, the project, remember, I left the university in 84, got this job as editor in 86, and the first volume was coming out in 1989, or 19, just after. So we were putting this thing to bed. And 1989 is not a good year to be writing an encyclopedia because everything is changing. The Berlin Wall is coming down, you know. Yeah. The Soviet Union is shortly going to break up into pieces. Thanks to you. Everything is happening all over the world. And we're trying to put it into an encyclopedia. <laughs> so the first edition comes out in 89. The second uh, corrected, uh, updated edition in 1990. Another one in 1991. And I was asked to give a lecture to the Royal Institution uh, in London, uh, where they have a thing called a Friday evening lecture. And they invite people in to talk about whatever, science, technology, in my case, encyclopedia writing. Mm. So I told them some of the stories about uh, how it is that um, you try and keep an encyclopedia up to date. And it's very difficult because people aren't talking uh, about it. Uh, When the Soviet Union was about to break up and we didn't know if it was, I had a deadline. So I would ring up the embassies and say, excuse me, Soviet Union, are you going to break up in the next few days? Uh, And they would say, who are you? You know, (laughs) why do you want to know? Uh, No, all is well. There is to be no breakup of Soviet Union and all this, you see. So we would do this. We always check with the embassies and things of that kind. I ring up the foreign office uh, and they say the same thing. No, dear boy, you know, Soviet Union is not going to break up in the next... No, 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 don't worry about it. You can put it in your encyclopedia. All of this is going on. (laughs) Uh, But then I hear, just as we're going to press, the news that there is going to be, in place of the Soviet Union, a Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS. And I do some digging and some inquiring and find out that, yes, indeed, this is likely to happen. It's not necessarily going to happen, but it is likely to happen. Which countries are going to be in there? I find out as much as I can about it. Now, the question is, I have to send my... Uh, copy off to the publisher next Monday. Mm. The book will come out in six months' time, by which time will there or won't there be a Commonwealth of Independent States? If I put it in and there isn't, the book will be laughed at. If I don't put it in and there is, the book will be laughed at. What do I do? So I decide to write an entry on the Commonwealth of Independent States this is all fact. This happened. Yeah. And, and you know, come of independent states, and I put it in, and off it goes to Cambridge. Fingers crossed. Eventually, of course, there is. But at that time, we did not know. So you had to make a prediction, pretty much. I had, had to make to a prediction. Place a bet, sort of thing. I had to basically say, the Soviet Union is going to disappear, and the Commonwealth of Independent States will appear, because it says so in the encyclopedia. Right? Now, that's what yeah. happened. So then I started to think, in terms of the novella, hey, the encyclopedia manuscript arrives in Cambridge, where there is a mole. And the Cambridge guy thinks, what does Crystal know? He's obviously got an insight into something that's going on here. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in Cambridge Encyclopedia. He knows something about what's happening. I'd better get in touch with all the nations around that are not wanting the Soviet Union to fragment and let them know that Crystal is onto us. And that's where the novel starts. Uh, So then they come after you in some some manner, I suppose. They most certainly do. Wow. 
Great. And there is a chase and there is a gunfight and there is all sorts of things <laughs> happen. It's great fun. Great. It sounds, sounds so entertaining. I'm going to look <laughs> forward to reading it. It's really good. Um, I, I, I want to ask you some other things um, before, before I let you go. That's one of those things that people say, isn't it, at the end of a conversation? I'll let you go now. <laughs> before I let you go. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of really interested in jokes and in humor and stuff uh, in, on my podcast. I often do stuff about that. I do stand up myself. And I was thinking, have you ever written about jokes in English? Have you written about the place of humor in the language? I'm also curious to know if, and this, this, is, a, this is one of those terrible questions which contains lots of questions all at the same time. <laughs> I can't be brief for some reason. I'm also curious to see if you've ever considered doing comedy because, because of the kind of humor that I notice in your work and because of the way that you observe things. Sometimes I think that you would look at the world in the same way that a stand-up comedian would look at the world, observing it and then sort of telling us what you've observed. Yours is from the point of view of linguistics and telling people how language works and, and you know, observing, pointing out things. The comedian kind of does the same thing but presents it for for, for laughs but anyway um, um what is my question well no i mean you, you you've made the point and, yeah. and the point and the response is i would be horrified if and i if i gave a lecture and it did not have some laughs in it mm. um consciously controlled laughs i mean not inadvertent ones yeah yeah uh, like designed. I always, try, always try to build humor uh, into the lecture, e even if it's on the most serious of topics. And if it's not humor in, in the sense of satirical humor, it's as I was sympathetic humor. Because you can tell uh, stories that make people laugh, even about the most serious of subjects, like language death, uh, f for instance. There are some lovely, funny stories about uh, that, that arise out of the horrible situation of a language dying. Um, and there is no reason why you shouldn't reflect the reality of the communities from which these stories come, uh, so long as the overall message retains its impact and its seriousness and so on. But most of the talks that I give are not that serious in that sense. Uh, and it's dead easy to introduce an element of humour if, if you're talking about accents, for instance, and dialects or prescriptivism or grammar, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. I mean, a lecture on grammar without a few jokes in it is a disaster in, in yeah. my mind. <laughs> and I think many teachers would feel exactly the same thing. So uh, I don't see that much difference indeed between uh, being a stand-up and, and being a lecturer. Lecturers are stand-ups after, after all, for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, just but when it comes to analysing humour in this kind of way, uh, I have done a bit of that. There are some sections in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of the English Language, which are basically on the language of humour, language of jokes and things of that kind. I never really, never ever researched it myself very much, oh, except in the context of language acquisition, child language acquisition, where the interesting research question was, when do children first start telling jokes, as it were, and what sort of jokes do they tell? Um, and what are the linguistic issues that will prevent a child from appreciating the source of a joke? So any of you out there who have got children in the five year to seven year old range will have had this experience, especially if there are older children in the family. Uh, the older child comes in, for example, and, and tells a joke, or is watching the television and laughs at a joke, and the younger child says, what, 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 why was that funny? What was that? What, what's mm -hmm. funny about that? And the older kid gets cross because, yeah, well, don't be silly, because it was funny, you know, and, and the little yeah. row breaks out. Because between five and seven, there is a very important development. The notion of a riddle yeah. is one that is opaque to five-year-olds. Seven-year-olds, are starting to understand what riddles are and how they play with words and how the two meanings and puns, things like that. Five-year-olds on the whole find puns impossible to interpret. Seven-year-olds are beginning to interpret them fine. So that's the kind of developmental thing that one looks at and, and explores and sees what sorts of things are going on. So I've looked at that, but there are some people who specialized in this, of course. Yeah, yeah. What about jokes? 
um, I suppose if you haven't looked at it yet, I don't know if you're able to comment on it really, but uh, uh, what's the point of jokes? <laughs> what do you think <laughs> about that? <laughs> well, it's, it's part of a bigger issue. What is the function of language? Now, look language up in a, in a dictionary and it will say the function of language is to communicate ideas. Fine, all right, there's a lot of that. That's what we're doing now. That misses out a second function of language, which is to express identity, which is what accents and dialects are all about. That misses out on the third primary function of language, which is to have fun, to enjoy it for itself. And humor is part of that. Now, this is, in a sense, the most important function of language because it is the very first. From the moment a child is born, it encounters language play. I wrote a whole book at once called Language Play. You can see it. It's available on my website. Yeah. And that starts at birth. Because when a baby is born, the baby doesn't come into a world of second language teaching. You know, <laughs> hello, baby. You are a baby. This is your mother. That is a wall. You are in a hospital. This is a doctor. That <laughs> is a nurse. That is <laughs> not what you get when you're just born. Unless you're my daughter, in which case <laughs> is the case. That's all. Anyway. Yeah, I know later on, yeah. yes, second year language, darling, don't touch that plug. That's dangerous. That's the hot tap. Don't touch the hot tap. That's second year parent child language. No, first year parent child language goes something like this. Oh, you lovely little baba, you are the gorgeous baba. Yes, you are, you are, you are gorgeous. Mm, 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 <laughs> and so on and so forth. And when you analyze parent-child language in the first year of life, what you find is that most of it is playful. Not explicitly baby talk like that, but at baby talk elements come in all the time. And the aim is to have the child enjoy the language encounter, the language experience. Mm. It goes all the way through the first year of life and then diminishes as the second year teaching language comes in, but it's always there. So when people have been studying the language of humor, what they notice is that what children laugh at um, or don't laugh at uh, is always underpinning the actual language acquisition that expresses ideas and identity and all the rest of it. Two, I've got a recording here of two three-year-olds playing together, two three-year-old girls, uh, and they've got little animals, and one is saying, mine's got wings, yours hasn't, and the other says, no, mine's got no wingos, and the other one says, no wingos and dringos and zingos and dingos, and the other one says, the wingy woes and wingy woes and dingy woes, and, and they're all having a great time. They're not laughing at each other, but they are enjoying the humor of language play. And this is always there. And you and I do the same sort of thing. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, if neither of us were stand-ups, as it were, nonetheless, when we're having a conversation, and in the book I talk a lot about this, people are always playing with language, putting on silly voices, you know, adopting a strange accent to make a joke, yeah. or whatever it might be. Yeah, absolutely. We're all humorists, really. So it is, it is a, it's a third important underlying principle I think, I think so. I think humor is, is a part of this. Yeah. Um, everybody enjoys language, play, or yeah. plays with language for themselves. Now, some of the listeners and viewers here might say, but I, I'm sorry, David, I, I, don't, I, I don't make silly voices. I, I don't adopt silly accents and things like that. So what are you going to say to that? Well, I, in return, I say, ah, but you play with language in a different way then. Do you do crossword puzzles? Do you play Scrabble? And suddenly you realize these are ways of playing with language as well, for enjoying language play. And they can generate laughs, or they may not, but it's the enjoyment is the thing. And that's why you tell the joke. Not necessarily to get a laugh, although it's nice if it happens, mm -hmm. but that people enjoy the encounter they've had with you um, and go away thinking, oh, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if, uh, I mean, you know, you're not a teacher, per se, but uh, oh. a language teacher. But um, I wonder if sort of adding humor, doing, looking at jokes in the language learning classroom or language learning scenario, 
is a is a good move. I'm always wondering this because I feel compelled to do it. For I'm not sure why, but it just well probably because I just enjoy you know enjoy it. But uh, I wonder if it is useful to incorporate jokes and humour into the language learning environment. Well, I think it is if jokes and humour are part of the environment of the language that the person is learning. Uh, now, I suppose all cultures have some sort of jokey, humorous element, but some more than others. Um, mm. and, and some don't let it come to the surface so much. So it would depend on the language, I think, depend on the culture. But in our culture, uh, it is a very important feature, as I've tried to explain in the yeah. language acquisition context. Yeah. Yeah. And what I would say is that um, it's a bit like child language acquisition, second language learning, isn't it? And some, of course, people in your world have tried to draw a specific parallel between first language and second language acquisition. Yeah. Well, just in the same way as a seven-year-old can't uh, use his humor, use his jokes, which a five-year-old can't understand, I imagine analogously, there would be certain types of jokes which a learner who had reached a certain level would not be able to understand simply because the language is too complicated uh, for that sort of access. Mm. So one of the things I would do if I was uh, researching this in your world, and I suppose some people have, is I take all the jokes and all the riddles and everything and I grade them, you know, as, as, as a syllabus of, of humour on which jokes are going to be easy to understand and which jokes are going to be more difficult. For whatever reason, it might be to do with the, the vocabulary, might do with the grammatical construction, might be a, a, an intonational contrast, it might be a, a, a pun based on pronunciation, it might be a spelling joke after yeah. all could be any of these things and some are going to be easy and some are going to be hard and there's going to be a spectrum now, I don't know whether anybody's done this uh, but it'd be nice if they did there was a um a study I'm not sure how serious it was in on various levels there was a study done by Richard Wiseman I don't know if you're familiar with him um and he, they did a, a subject a study called laugh lab where they asked people to um uh, contribute jokes and the, this was on the internet it was across you know various cultures from different countries people contributed jokes in English and then the jokes were graded and, and so on yeah. and, and voted on and the one that received the most votes was it, it was interesting because there was no pun involved in it not really there wasn't really a homophone or anything like that in there um, and uh, it didn't have any specific cultural references and yeah. that seemed to be the one that, you know, yeah. metal, you know, the, the center of the Venn diagram was the one that everyone was able to get, basically. Yeah, everyone was able to relate to it. Oh, that's yeah. lovely if you can find some examples like that. But the vast majority, of course, are not going to be like that. That, as it were, is the easy case. Yeah. Um, the yeah. tricky ones are the ones where there is some cultural or linguistic element. I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. um, you know, a difficult one because the word that is the point of the joke is difficult. Yeah. It's in every seven year old book of jokes. When is a door not a door? Answer, when it's a jar. Right. Now, <laughs> because the word ajar, a j a r, is not in any f list of the most frequently occurring words in English, very few foreign learners would know that word. And so the joke would go over their heads, as indeed it goes over the heads of any seven year old even you know that's a joke that perhaps a 10 year old might get or something of that sort so that's what i mean if you if you look at the words this is one way of grading in vocabulary you you, you take the frequency lists and all the things that are, that are routine in the second language world and you look at the jokes that's one corpus you've got the jokes in another corpus and then you see well where does a jar fit what's well, down there that's mm. the mm. whereas another joke uses easy puns and that's up there you could do the same sort of thing for grammar, uh, pronunciation, and so on, I imagine. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. I just have two more things to ask you before I let you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the questions I often get from my listeners is about the subject of raising bilingual kids. I just thought I'd you know, see what you had to say about this. So the, I'm going to try and boil it down as much as I can. Let's, so that the, the issue is, should 
uh, the parents speak English to their kids, even if the parents don't have English as a first language. So let's say uh, the parents are living in a, a country where English isn't the first language. Uh, neither of the parents speak English as a first language. Maybe they're intermediate, upper intermediate or something like that. And they want their child to, to grow up, you know, speaking English. Should the parents speak English to the child, even if they aren't uh, proficient uh, in English? The most important principle in all multilingualism with acquisition is be natural. The home is a natural place. Uh, if the parent, in one scenario, one parent speaks one language, the other parent speaks the other language, question that arises, which language should we use? Answer, use both, if it's natural to use both. If there is one language for the home, use that. If there are two languages in the home and the kid is encountering these two languages, not just between parents, but with grandparents around or people who help in the house or whatever it might be, or out in the street. Expose, let the child develop. Remember from the point of view of the child, yeah. the child does, the young child we're talking about now, up to the age of about three and a half. Okay. The child does not know they are different languages. All the child knows is that dad speaks one way, mum speaks another way. And now she's speaking in another way again. Well, I mean, oh, that's life. That's fine, you know. And, and the kid doesn't know that there's a pronunciation problem in the English that's being used by the mother or by the father or what have you, if there is. Or if there's a grammatical error, you know, pretty precocious two-year-old to say, oh, father, you know, that <laughs> pre preposition is, you know. No, only in the fourth year of life, do children realize that there are such things as different languages? They start to name those languages and start to trade one language off against the other. There are many studies on this now. Uh, this sort of scenario where it's bedtime, French speaking mother, German speaking father. German speaking father comes up to the kid and says in German, it's bedtime. And the kid says in French, I don't speak German. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see, that yeah. kind of kid realizes that there are two languages, tries to trade one off against the other for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, so it's fourth year of life, that. Before that, everything is up for grabs. The kid is amazing. I mean, this is the thing about young children, that they have this immensely flexible language learning device, as it used to be called, perhaps still is in some places, um, and uh, they just assimilate whatever is around them. They mix them up, of course. Well, that's natural as well. There's nothing wrong with that. They'll sort it all out eventually, especially beginning in the fourth year, and realize, oh, those things go with the French thing I'm called, and those things go with the German thing that it's called, and so on. Oh, I see. Uh, and those things go with the English thing that it's called. So, first of all, I wouldn't worry. Be natural. Second point. The situation you outline is very, very common around the world, extremely common because of the incidence of um, multicultural language, uh, multicultural marriages or yeah. partnerships or whatever you call them these days. Yeah. So uh, I'm now thinking of a scenario that I encountered in the Emirates where I met a, a German industrialist, an oil man who had met and married a lady from Malaya, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, he spoke German, she spoke Malay. The only language they had in common was second language English. Mm -hmm. And they spoke respectively, because I heard them both, in a very, you know, non-British American kind of way. Yeah. Uh, the, the Malay lady had a very uh, syllable timed rhythm, for instance. The German guy couldn't say TH to save his life. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> to save his life. They, yeah. they are <laughs> chattering quite happily away to each other. This is the language of the home. Yeah. And the kid is now growing up learning English as a second language as its mother tongue. Wow. You see, because it hears no other English. What kind of English is that going to be? Well, it's going to be a very different kind of variety from what you'd expect in a monolingual uh, uh, na native speaker type of situation. Now that kid is not alone because that kid goes to a creche uh, where everybody else is in the same boat. 
not, well, not everybody, but you know, there are lots of other kids who are also being brought up in English by parents where English is not the first language. Now, I have no idea how many kids in the world are in this position, but we are talking a lot. Yeah. And so I don't, I mean, it, I would love to see a study of a kid who begins that way or kids who begin that way. And in five, how are they, what are they in five years time, in 10 years time? When they get to school and they start to learn standard English and all the things that they'll learn there, to what extent will their native command of the English be the same as the standard English they're now encountering? Will it be different? Yeah, it's a lovely research domain here. Mm. And again, I don't know of anything written on it, but then I'm not a specialist in that. So there may be something there. I just, I wonder, yeah, I guess um, just speculating about it. I could, I can imagine that it would be easier for that child who's been learning English as a second language from their parents who speak it as a second language, that it would be easier for them to make the transition to this standard English that, that they would be exposed to later than it would be if they had had no uh, exposure to English at all. Mm. So, because, you know, people, I guess the question is, is it worth um, talking to my child in English when my English is not quote unquote perfect or quote unquote native or not like yours, Luke, or whatever it is. I, I, my answer yeah. to that would be yes, yes it is. Yeah. Uh, because it, e even though there may be some, in inverted commas, errors that translate, that transmit, yeah. um, an awful lot of the time, the, the vocabulary for instance and so on, is probably likely to be, to be pretty accurate, you know, and the pronunciation is not going to be too far away. And in any case, we mustn't just talk about parents here. Because these days, how do you avoid English? Um, as you go out into the streets or watch the television or listen to pop music or go onto the internet and so on. Now, I know we're talking here mainly about slightly older children, uh, but uh, I've come across kids who are fluent in internet speak, <laughs> as it were, they're, yeah. you know, or video games and things of this kind, and they're picking up all kinds of English from all over the place. And you know, the, there is more instinctive awareness of English around than I think we sometimes give credit for. Okay, so I guess for that listener or those listeners who've asked me that question, the answer would be yes, go ahead. <laughs> oh, ab ab absolutely. I mean, yeah. You know, it, it happens all the time. We have it here in Wales, only, only now we're talking about Welsh, um, where yes. somebody is not a very good Welsh speaker, uh, but nonetheless wants, to, wants the kid to have some experience of Welsh. So they introduce as much Welsh into their everyday life as they possibly can. When they're going down the street and they see a Welsh sign, they articulate it uh, to the child and, and things like that. So the kid is on a career track towards Welshness, even though the parents are only going to help them a little way along that road. Yeah, a little way is better than nothing. Oh, it's absolutely, in my yeah. view. Yeah. Um, final question. And I, I sort of have my reservations about asking this to you, mainly because it's based on a conversation I had with my brother uh, at the weekend. I talked to you earlier about how people find certain things in language to be annoying. I just wanted to see what you think about this. I hope, <laughs> okay. he, doesn't, I hope he doesn't mind me asking you this. I did say, I think I better ask David Crystal about this. And he was like, oh, so we'll see how he feels about, about me asking you this. So, yes, we were talking about something that irritates him. Okay, so here's the situation. He's in a shop, okay, um, and uh, he's paying for his shopping. He wants to pay by card. He ends up saying, can I pay by card? And the shop assistant says, of course, in a way that suggests that it's obvious that he can pay by card, or that he didn't really need to ask for permission to pay by card. But uh, my brother finds it annoying that the person goes, yeah, of course. Um, so <laughs> I said to him, well, you know, uh, you did just say, can I pay by card? And his problem is that he can't think of an alternative to can I pay by card? He doesn't want to say, I'm going to pay by card. Because as far as he's concerned, that is too direct and makes him sound a bit arrogant. So... I wasn't, we weren't unable, we weren't able to conclude the conversation. And I just want to know what you think about this. I don't know if you've got an answer to this, um, but what uh, do you could, think about could, this situation? Could, could I, I pay my card? card? Yeah, of course. Oh. 
you know, could uh, is, is less ambiguous in, in many ways. We're talking here about a, a, a classic ambiguity in modal auxiliaries. Yeah. Um, and can uh, is famous for its two meanings, um, can in the sense of be able to and can in the sense of permission. And I don't know whether how many of my, our listeners and viewers will ever have had the experience of being in a primary school um, where the kid says, uh, can I go to the toilet? And the teacher says, David, may I go to the toilet? And they attempt to get the child to replace the word can with the word may. And this is a, a you know, a, a classic politeness um, strategy, mm. which sometimes has worked and sometimes hasn't, because can retains its ambiguity. So whenever you say can about something, um, there is always a context usually resolves this, of course, perfectly clearly. Um, uh, it, but the ambiguity is always there. Uh, can, I, can I ride my bike? Uh, well, I don't know. Have you learned to ride? I mean, this could be the basis of a good joke, you see. Yeah. Uh, you stand up <laughs> guy, uh, uh, where, where, where the person deliberately takes the other meaning um, out of the situation. Right. So the person who is um, responding in the supermarket is taking one meaning out of it, whereas the speaker is presenting a different meaning, don't you think? <laughs> and the only way out of this is to avoid the auxiliary altogether. Um, go for the conditional form, which is less ambiguous. You know, could I, could I pay by card? Which is less ambiguous than can I pay by card? Yeah, yeah. Um, or, you know, use a different construction if it's if it's really irritating i mean isn't that the principle if you find something irritating you avoid it i suppose so yeah I, i'm just I, I right now i just thought maybe he should just say card okay i think that's probably what he needs to say just <laughs> yeah. lift the card and go card okay that's probably yeah. good that's probably it. yeah well you know this is a I, this is a strategy that i did come across once a, a jokey classroom session where um i, I was observing not giving it uh, where the people were getting real problems with, with tag questions uh, and how a tag question should relate in auxiliary verbs, you know, I'm going, aren't I? You're going, aren't you? She's going, isn't she? And yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, in real trouble with this. Yeah. So in the end, the teacher says, all you've got to do is go to say, in it. At the end. I'm going, in it. You're going, in it. She's going, in it. Well, it's all the problems, all the problems. <laughs> Mm. So, you know, or if you don't want in it, you know, just I'm going, eh? You're going, eh? She's going, eh? <laughs> so, so maybe this is a situation where you avoid it and uh Yeah. I think I think breaking the breaking down the sentence to the absolute bare minimum is probably okay in this scenario. Well the less you say, the less you're likely to be misinterpreted <laughs> in ancient tradition. It goes against the principle of language teaching somehow though. <laughs> yes, I think so. Um well David, thank you so much for talking to me and to my audience again um on my podcast. It's been a pleasure and uh I look forward to uncovering the mystery of the encyclopedia codes. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. I hope people enjoy them, uh, these books indeed. And well, thank you for your interest and hope people have enjoyed this conversation too. Thank Me you. too. <laughs>